Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our show. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. And today we're privileged to have with us Robert Westheimer, who is author of the book, When God Calls, How Do You Answer? So welcome to the program, Robert. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Sure. Well, you know, um, it, it, nice title, nice uh, concept, because um, it gives us the idea that um, God does call and reach out to us, and God cares for us, and Scripture teaches that, you know, God thinks about us, and the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. So there's that reaching out aspect, and I think that a lot of people feel like, you know, God's this distant entity, and, you know, we're so uh, disconnected, but this title really brings to my mind, you know, there's a overt and um, action where God is coming toward us and calling to us. So how do we answer? So can you tell us how that concept came about and uh, what the book is uh, covering? Sure. Um, And I guess I would just say by introduction, uh, we all have this sort of mental model of, uh, you know, either a bolt of lightning hitting us or, you know, having some sort of a plan or dream or vision uh, almost from youth, and that you know we're called to do something. It's laid out for us. We know exactly what we're getting into, and, and that is not my story. My story is more of one working in a, a, a career, a business consulting career, and hearing sort of a, a whisper, not a bolt of lightning, uh, a gentle nudge uh, over the years, and one that I finally acted on in my 60s. Uh, to say yes to something that I wasn't quite sure what it was. And what hmm. I said yes to was starting a, a, a Christ-centered, not-for-profit, uh, aimed at economic development uh, that used my business skills, but also something that was very ill-defined and just letting God define it one step at a time uh, without a long-term plan, without a really clear-cut vision for it, and letting, letting God supply that vision. You know that's a that's a great point. Um, sometimes we will not get a an explicit uh, checklist of um, dear Robert, God calling. Please follow these steps and let me know when you're done. So, um, what was it that um, made you realize that that still small voice and that whisper was kind of becoming more and more loud? And and what made you finally realize, like, oh yeah, you're talking to me? Yeah, it was it was a little bit of a convergence of things. Uh, I had worked. Uh, my whole career as a business consultant for the accounting firm Arthur Anderson, which was the firm you may remember was brought down in the in the Enron scandal in mm-hmm. 2002. And I had cancer that year and had surgery for that. And it, it just seemed like there was a convergence of things that were uh, telling me that something needed to change, something something needed to be different in my life. This gentle whisper I'd been hearing uh, that God wanted to call me to, to do something became a little bit louder. And I began to say, look, I'm at a point in life where I need to say yes to something. And even I don't, if I don't know exactly what it is, uh, maybe I need to sort of suspend my desire for certainty in all things and just step into something in faith uh, and say yes to it. And uh, all, all God really needs, I think, is for us to say yes to that first step. We don't have to see where the road's going. We don't have to have road signs or maps. We just have to say yes to that first step. And so the story, the, the book is really the story of that, is ha- what happens after you say yes to that first uh, call from God. Yeah, and I'm sure that, um, that there were quite a few missteps, because I, I would think that even as you take that first step of faith, you're, you tend to question, you know, is, is this step right? And, okay, I'm following down the path, but is this step you know, getting me closer there. So um, what what were some of those lessons you learned when you started questioning yourself, even though you were in the process of taking a step of faith? Yeah, there were, like, there were a lot of missteps, and there still are missteps. What, mm-hmm. what I've learned by looking back at the missteps uh, is that God used those. And so we, we would try something, and it would fail, or it appeared to fail, uh, and I would think, gee, I'm, I'm, what am I doing wrong here? I'm doing something wrong or something's not happening or I'm not listening well. Uh, but if, if I could fast forward to the aftermath of that, I would begin to see 
that what I thought was a failure might not have been a failure. It was simply a stepping stone to what God was leading me to next. And so we would try new uh, program areas, and they would, they would be marginal at best, if not total failures. But in the failure of those, they would lead us to something else that we couldn't foresee mm-hmm. that appeared to be where God was hitting us in the, in the first place. Uh, and so when we look backward, we would see the failures or things we thought were failures were simply step, stepping stones. And, and hard as it is, uh, I'm learning to suspend my personal judgment of what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, what's a failure or a success, uh, because God uses it all. Yeah, and even in our um, moments of unbelief, you know, um, you know, because I know Scripture teaches, you know, you know, teach us to have more faith and give us more wisdom and you know, help our unbelief because we're human, we're we're carnal, and I think that God knows that. And also, there's a um, I recently heard a message where it was brought out about you know um, uh, this the verse that says uh, God's mercies are new every morning. Well, if you think about that, what really is new? Well, if you you know have God's mercies and grace today, that's good. And then tomorrow is it the same? No, because why would it be the same? We have brought new things on ourselves where we need mercy and grace for. So, I think that can be an encouragement to help us um, when we do make those missteps to say, you know what, God, I messed up, but your word says your mercies are new every morning, and you know I'm going to claim that grace and claim that mercy, and you know how can I move on from here? And and it reminds me too of that uh, graphic we've probably all seen with you know the line that starts from left to right in a nice diagonal straight line, and it goes beginning and success. You know this is people's you know, expectation of the road to success, but in reality it's this whole squiggly line up, down, to sideways, and circles, and then you end up at the same place. But really it's this whole uh, mess that that you literally are kind of going through, walking through times of desert, and, and you have to learn from that because you either win or you, most people would say lose, but really you win or you learn. Um, and, and how do we appreciate what was given to us if we just were handed it day one? You, sometimes you, we have to learn from that. So can you think of a specific uh, um, stumbling block or a point that you struggled with, and then what was the actual lesson that was learned that you then you know, went to that next level? Absolutely, and uh, actually our, our ministry began with a church planting experience coming out of my home church, uh, which really wasn't all that successful. Uh, we planted two churches, one of them failed, and the other was, was successful. Uh, but if that hadn't happened, the whole ministry of New Spring would never have happened, mm. because it put us in a position uh, to start the ministry. We did all the research on it, and coming out of the church planting experience, uh, but if we hadn't failed a couple of times, we would never be where we are today. And so uh, there's a, a great line in one of the Richard Rohr books uh, where he, in fact, the title of the book is Everything Belongs. And I've sure learned that, that everything does belong. We, God uses everything. And uh, one of the chapters in my book, it talks about uh, how impure I think I am and how can God use me if I'm impure? How can God use mm-hmm. me if I make mistakes and fail? Uh, and God has never gives us a test. He, he never uh, looks at our Myers Briggs. He never uh, gives us any kind of a purity test before He can use us. Uh, as I read Scripture, I'm so comforted when I see the people, the kinds of people uh, who God calls. Uh, the, <laughs> they're all people like me. They're people who yeah. are very unlikely. Uh, they're people who stumble all the time. Uh, and God yet God uses them and never tests them, never requires a purity code for them to pass. And that's just a great, great comfort to me. Well, you mentioned purity, and uh, I'm sure you've heard this as well, but it makes me think of um, how do you remove impurities from something like metal? Well, mm-hmm. you put it in a big old cauldron and heat the daylights out of it to, you know, <laughs> temperatures beyond belief, and then the impurities rise to the top and scrape it off. Well, isn't that indicative of our life, where God needs to raise the heat in our life to take us through those harder times, learn those lessons, and if we, if we keep resisting and not learning the lessons we need to learn, we're going to keep 
being in the fire. But when we can relax and kind of be, stop being a human doing and be more of a human being and kind of be still and know that I am God kind of a, a approach and let the work be done, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, got the, those impurities scraped off the top. Let's turn the heat down and see what we have to work with. Well, and one of the major themes of the book is along those lines that we, we can't just stand on the sidelines waiting to be purified. We have to get in the game. And if mm-hmm. that means it's a little bit messy, if that means we do have to get close to the fire, uh, if that means that we have to let God purify us or deal with what we think is failure, we still have to say yes. We still have to get in the game. And my fear is that there are too many of us in our culture today who want everything defined so fully and want success to be predicted so absolutely that they never get in the game. Mm-hmm. And so finally, I reached a point in my life where I said, I'm going to have to get in the game, uh, even if I don't know exactly where I'm going, and even if I don't feel good enough uh, to be used by God. And God has been so faithful to me and those around me to say, you know, I'm going to use you no matter what, and I'm going to purify you in the process. Yeah, you know, it makes me think of um, a, a few statements and thoughts. Uh, one of my favorite speakers is Les Brown, and he's famous for saying, um, jump and grow your wings on the way down. And that kind of it lays the foundation for, you know, if there's anything worth doing, it's worth failing at first. So you just got to kind of get out there and get started and don't have uh, paralysis by analysis. And uh, too many people... F- feel that, well, um, I'm, I'm not qualified, so God doesn't, isn't going to call me, and I'll wait until then, and I'll just kind of see if I'm, well, God doesn't call the qualified. He, as you know, qualifies the called, and right. he does that work, and he um, um, gets, gets you ready and gets you qualified, and you're never going to attain and be there. There's always going to be that personal development, spiritual development, and, you know, we should be ashamed if we think like, okay, good, I'm, I'm there, I'm, I've arrived, because now all of a sudden pride is creeping up. Well, and there's also great strength in the community of believers who are who are working together, praying together, working side by side uh, in, a, in a Christ-centered ministry. And so one of the things we've really emphasized and is emphasized in, in the book is, is the strength that you gain by working together, journeying together with a group of people who uh, believe that the Christ-centeredness of your ministry is the most important thing. If you have to do it alone, it's a very lonely road. Uh, but calling together a group of people uh, who will put Christ first in the ministry, uh, there's tremendous, tremendous power in that. Exactly. Um, and, and you bring up uh, one of the points that your book covered, which is spiritual entrepreneurship. And I think that too many people think that, okay, Sunday I've got my church hat on, and then Monday I've got my business hat on, and they're mutually exclusive, but they're not. Um, it, sh- it should be an integrated approach. So can you speak to just like a good 30,000-foot view of what uh, spiritual entrepreneurship would look like and entail? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, is I think uh, many of us, and, and this is certainly applies to me, have lived much of our lives uh, in compartments. As you said, we have our, our business life, we have our family life, we have our church life, uh, and we develop uh, false selves. I call them working definitions. This is who I project myself to be at work, and it's a different projection at church. It's a different projection in my social life, and we live our lives in compartments. What's What's uh, happened in my life, and I've written about this a lot in the book, is, is I'm, I'm eliminating those compartments. It's becoming more integrated. And so uh, I've been on a lot of boards of uh, not for, faith-based not-for-profits, and frankly, you'd never know to look at them that they were faith-based. They might open a meeting with a prayer, and that's about all you'd ever see. They kind of check that off and dive into the budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we've done in New Spring is we've integrated all that, and so we're very intentional about our spiritual focus. Uh, we pray together. We have a have an annual prayer breakfast for the community. Uh, we have prayer retreats, silent retreats. We do a lot of things together, and so the spiritual vitality of the organization is not lost. There's a tremendous uh, temptation to let it drift away, and we work very hard to keep that spiritual focus. Yeah, you know, just this morning I was at a Christian business 
uh, networking group called the Kingdom Business Alliance here in Denver. And um, it's it, we talked literally just about what you just said, which is too many times a business will look at the normal metrics like the balance sheet, the income statement, and, and just dive right into the numbers and go, how are we doing? Because that's how we evaluate. A pilot will evaluate pre-flight, post-flight. Um, well, there should be a nice, strong handful of metrics that we evaluate along with the balance sheet and financial statements, because you have to. If you don't turn a profit, you may go out of business, and then you cannot have that kingdom impact. So there has to be, you know, good, good numbers. But what other spiritual and kingdom-focused metrics can there be? Have Has a business owner ever um, brought someone to uh, salvation through Jesus Christ in their their workplace, one of their vendors, one of their employees. Um, so that would be a wonderful metric. Um, have you ever, you know, seen through your business um, someone, whatever, you know, they had a, a, a tragedy in their personal life and the business came along their side and visited them at the hospital and brought meals to them. It, that's a small way that you can have that kind of an impact. Can you think of one of those type of metrics that you would uh uh, like to see or that you recommend seeing in a business? Well, and, and for us, we deal a lot with, with youth. And uh, and so, yeah, we, we do, and it's a very unchurched community that we deal with. And so uh, we have, I'm not sure I'd say metrics, we have the stories of the young people uh, who we work with, and we are bringing them to Christ. And so we track them. Uh, we yeah. track them all the way through middle school, through high school, and into and out of college, and so we know their their lives. It's a very relational ministry, and, and I would say, and I write about this in the book, if if you're dealing with it strictly from the 50,000-foot level, uh, which you probably would in a real business, uh, you're not going to see those stories. If you're on the ground, you're face-to-face with the people you serve. Uh, and that's one big difference, I think, between spiritual entrepreneurship and business entrepreneurship. We can deal with people one at a time. We can deal with people relationally because that's what we're called to do. That's what Jesus did. And so uh, we have the stories of the people that we serve, uh, and we don't stay up at a 50,000-foot or board or committee level. We're down in the trenches with our, our the people that we serve. Yeah, that's that, you, you can anybody can write a check and donate it someplace and think I've contributed and you have, but the the real rubber meets the road is when you can get into the community and make a difference that way. That's that's a uh, uh, super special. So um, let us know uh, what's the best way that we can learn more about your book and uh, and uh, find that what's uh, the website and uh, then we'll wrap up with uh, with that thought. We want people to be able to learn more about your your book. When God calls, how do you answer? Uh, the book is available on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble, and uh, so I, I hope people will go out and take a look at it there. Uh, the organization is called New Spring. Uh, we have a website. I'd love people to come take a look at the website. The uh, website address is www.newspringcenter. That's all one word: newspringcenter.org. And I'd love to have people take a look at what we do. Super. Well, it was great getting to know you, and uh, thank you for the work you're doing there in your community, and uh, continue to make uh, impact for the kingdom. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.